Taxonomically, we should note that in 1906, the massive European colonization of Africa had been going on only for about 25 years and was essentially in its first phase, which consisted largely of effacing local local cultures and replacing them with European administrative structures. The objects that came back from the newly acquired colonies were still seen as trophies or curiosities or pagan idols evidence of the primitive or childlike aspects of the people who made them. This is reflected in contemporary, contemporaneous writings, even by authors who were involved with the avant-garde, such as Elie Four, who in his uh, Histoire de l'Art wrote the first general history of art, from the prehistoric art to modern art in four volumes, uh, which included African art. And he included it, interestingly enough, in the medieval volume, because in the medieval volume, along with Asian art in the medieval volume also, by the way, these were religious arts, spiritual arts. And something that, that fascinates me about that, it's a little bit like what Ananda Kumar Swami said in his um, Oriental and Western Conceptions of Art, if I remember the title of the book correctly, in which he talks about the fact that the only true art is religious art. In any case, for doesn't think it's the only true art that is religious art, but he puts all the religious arts together no matter where they come from on the earth. And, but here's what he writes rather, in rather racist terms, although he did not mean this malevolently, but you can, you can see what a, a racist charge it has. And also what a kind of exaggerated fantasy quality what he says has. He says, I quote, but to him, the African, we must not look for metaphysical abstracts, for he gives us only his sensations, as short-lived as they are violent, and attempt to satisfy the most immediate needs that spring from a rudimentary fetishism. And perhaps it is even because of his fearful candor in showing us rough surfaces, short limbs, bestial heads, and drooping breasts that he reaches his great expressiveness. These sculptures in wood, black wood on which pure blues, the raw greens, the brown reds take on a violence so naive that it becomes terrifying, have a simplicity in their ferocity, an innocence in their mood of murder that command a kind of respect. Brute nature circulates in them and burning sap and black blood. Really quite extraordinary uh, for somebody who was sympathetic in principle to both the art and the people. And it gives you, I, I read this passage because it gives you a sense of what the situation was in which these artists um, found themselves at the early, in the early part of the century. Now something else that should be said is that morphologically, European art since the Renaissance had been dominated by painting, by painting and had been based on three main values, none of which was present in African art the study of anatomy by which the human figure could be accurately rendered and set in space, the study of perspective or the science of rendering that space, and the study of chiaroscuro or the optical behavior of objects within that space. Um, artists who wanted to be modern had become disenchanted with the traditional post-Renaissance uh, manner of creating art as exemplified in 19th century academic painting most especially, especially uh, in paintings like, let's say, Bouguereau's Birth of Venus uh, with its insistence on meticulous imitation of appearances. Bouguereau, uh, Cezanne is supposed to have said once, I may not be very good, but I know that Bouguereau is awful. <laughs> in any case, um, And Matisse, by the way, studied with Bouguereau. And in fact, he studied with Bouguereau in 1891. And that same year, the American painter, Jefferson David Chalfont, painted this view of Bouguereau's studio. Matisse might have been somewhere in that crowd, although I don't see him there. Um, and by the way, that same year, or actually it was a year later, Matisse took the entrance examination to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts which consisted of five sections, anatomy, perspective, a model drawing after the antique, an architectural study, so you knew you could give things a setting, and an examination on general notions of history, so you would know what your subject should be. Um, he failed. 
In fact, he never passed the exam. He sort of got in the back door. Now, in 1906, there were also important exhibitions of works by Gauguin and Cezanne, and these played a crucial role. The Gauguin retrospective at the Salon d'Automne included a number of sculptures which inspired artists such as Durand and Matisse to carve in stone and in wood. I show you on the left um, Gauguin's Oviri of 1893-95, and on the right, uh, Durand's standing sculpture, uh, standing figure of 1907. And you, you realize, of course, from the dates that there's only 12 years or so between these two uh, pieces. In fact, Durand's response to African objects was most African objects was most directly felt in the primitive, primitivizing sculptures that he carved in wood and stone in late 1906 and in 1907. But like most artists of the period, he found it difficult to translate what he found in, meaningful in African sculpture directly into painting. As you can see here, this is a crouching figure in stone by uh, Durand. And as you can see in the picture on the right-hand side, it's virtually nothing of what he was looking at in African art, um, other than a certain kind of generally archaizing simplification of form. For, uh, for a while, he tried his hand at carved sculpture, which itself had significantly primitivist implications at the time. Many of you will remember that Baudelaire, in his influential essay uh, about the Salon of 1846, made the famous statement, Baudelaire detested sculpture. Or I should say he didn't detest it. He just thought it was a very low on the hierarchy of human endeavor. And he wrote, the origin of sculpture is lost in the mist of time. And it's an interesting thing because, of course, this is something that's constantly said about African cultures. It's lost in the mist of time. Thus, it is a Carib art. We find, in fact, that all races bring real skill to the carving of fetishes long before they embark upon the art of painting. You see, it's a kind of um, evolutionary structure, which is an art painting involving profound thought and one whose very enjoyment demands a particular initiation. Matisse also carved his only wood sculpture in 1907 after he saw the Gauguin show and while he was beginning to look at African art. But in, his, in this sculpture, he really skirted the main issues that had been raised by uh, African sculpture. Basically, basically it's, it, it's his painting style translated into relief. Most important to avant-garde artists at the time was the earth-shaking originality of Cezanne's painting, especially his treatment of the human figure. While the artists who were coming to maturity at this time were inspired by his art, they also initially saw it as a block to their own development. Cezanne presented a kind of impasse. In order to get around him, the avant-garde artists were forced to move outside their own tradition. 